Out of the darkness of slavery, freedom. Moses and the Israelites crossed into the Sinai Desert. Step number one to the top of Moses' Sinai. With flashlights in hand, my son Darius and I, along with our team, got up before dawn to join dozens of tourists and pilgrims to climb to the mountaintop and see the place where the Bible says God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Mount Sinai is no leisurely hike. I don't want to talk, I just want to climb. Two hours into our climb, we were getting tired. Darius thought a camel might be a nice break. But it's not as easy as it looks. As we regrouped in the dark and remote mountain range, it wasn't hard to imagine how the Israelites, waiting for Moses to return, got nervous. Moses is up on the mountain 40 days, 40 nights. The Israelites down at the foot of the mountain, terrified that he is gone. Alone, the Bible says the Israelites began to doubt the one God and took comfort in a familiar bad habit. At the very moment that Moses is sealing the deal with God, that's when they build the golden calf. When Moses came down from the mountain with the commandments, he was shocked to find they had abandoned all self-control, drinking, carousing, and worse, worshipping a false idol. He's furious. God's furious. Moses smashes the tablet. Ultimately, everybody shapes up, and Moses goes back up the mountain for a second shot at it. to the top of Mount Sinai. The sun has risen and we're amongst pilgrims from all over the world. And perhaps the sheer physical effort of getting up here adds to the spirituality. Glory, glory, the view is out of this world. And it seems fitting that this is the first and only place the Bible says man ever came face to face with God. No matter what your faith, what happened here, this part of the Exodus story, this part of Moses' story, has affected all of us for millennia. The Ten Commandments tell us not to kill, not to steal, not to lie. They tell us to worship and love God completely, to honor a day of rest, and to honor our mother and father. They have left an indelible mark on our moral code and our civil law. And in a sense, they're an early unifying response to the chaos and cruelty of the world, a declaration that with freedom comes responsibility. It's why the Statue of Liberty, which was modeled on Moses, okay, the tablets in her arms, the rays of light on her head, both of which come from the moment in which Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. But like many stories in the Bible, things weren't so straightforward. The story most people know is that Moses got Ten Commandments on two tablets on Mount Sinai. There are a whole lot more than Ten Commandments, traditionally 613. Many of these laws must have had some meaning during the time of Moses, even if they seem puzzling to us today. If you're wearing a fabric, you are not allowed to mix that fabric, wool and linen, together. If you ask the rabbis why, the answer is, I don't know. God commanded it. God also commanded Moses to build a portable temple for the tablets called the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible tells us the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant and exactly what it looks like. It's a box, it's got long handles, uh, it's supposed to have cherubim or angels sort of on, on the top. Archaeologists have found evidence that boxes such as these were common in biblical times, suggesting that the Ark and its contents may have actually existed. And the ark would have come in handy because it was a long time before Moses and his people had a permanent place to settle. According to the Bible, the Israelites were constantly on the move, spending 40 arduous years wandering in the desert. For 40 years in the wilderness, 
The Jews just bitched at each other constantly. It is a non-stop rant. Um, we are human. We complain. We fetch. The Israelites actually had the temerity to say, maybe it would have been better to stay in Egypt. Can you imagine? Thank you. Oh, nice early morning to see the promised land. It is indeed. Moses, I'm not sure if it came early morning or evening. But <laughs> <laughs> we met Father Fabian overlooking the place that Moses has spent his whole life searching for. I think this is the last moment of the life of Moses. When he's standing here looking out, he's completed his mission. But Moses would never cross into the promised land. After years of carefully following God's orders, risking it all on faith, he was denied his goal because of one mistake. As God had done so many times before, he gave Moses some complicated orders to follow. He told him to speak to a rock to bring forth water. Instead, Moses smacked the rock with a stick. The water came, but God was angry, and he delivered an unspeakably harsh punishment. For not listening, God told Moses that though he had led his people here, they would go to the promised land without him. It strikes me that this must have been such a disappointment for him. That was his life's work. He knows that this is the end of his journey. He's delighted because he's finished. He's 120. The Bible says Moses did the only thing he could. He reassured his people. I told the story to my son and he was listening to it and he started to get, you know, weepy. It's very, it actually is quite an emotional story. If you think about all of the things that this person went through and then he can't enter the promised land. So my son, <laughs> I was telling it to him and he starts to get weepy. How do you comfort him? I say, we're here to tell the story. You know, that's the comfort actually. There's certain stories in the canon of storytelling, like the Greek myths, that just seem to capture our imagination over time and it's hard to imagine a future in which they're not told. Indeed, the story of Moses at Mount Nebo continues to echo powerfully even in our own time. It is the story of a leader who's taken his people as far as he's able to go and who leaves them with the only thing that will sustain them, faith and the justice of their cause. I see God working in the 20th century. Martin Luther King, who's been called the American Moses, gave this speech the night before he was assassinated. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Martin Luther King saying that just before he died, as if it was a premonition. I mean, you must have thought of that a lot. Well, of course I've thought of that a lot. I thought that he understood that his transition was at hand. He understood that it might even be a violent transition. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. 